Thank you. What are two days? Intense discussion, frank open conversations, productive partnerships, and a lot of bonds being formed. We are the last panel, and I'm sure it will be very insightful. I had some open comments for to kick things off, but I'm so excited by the three of you and what you bring to the table that I'm going to jump straight into the questions. The team today is compute infrastructure is the backbone of every AI success story. Yet, it remains a critical bottleneck in, the, in development and deployment. What this panel will do is bring together practitioners who will examine the practical realities of scaling AI solutions, from managing compute costs and accessibility to navigating infrastructural gaps in diverse environments. The discussion will explore pathways to building sustainable access models that enable AI solutions to move from pilots to population scale deployment, a point that previous speakers have also highlighted. A lot of the pilots don't go beyond the lab. I have with me Shiko Gitao, CEO of Kala, Raymond, founder of Horus Labs, and Raghu, CEO of Artpack. I'll introduce you one by one and then ask you the question so that uh, uh, we can jump straight into it. I want to begin with you, Raymond. So let me introduce Raymond. Raymond Ononivu is the founder and CEO of Horus Labs, a technology and infrastructure company building Africa's next generation digital backbone through modular, renewable-powered, AI-ready data centers. An engineer with more than 15 years of experience delivering products across mixed reality, Windows analytics, across mixed reality, Windows analytics, and Teams Copilot. His work has powered platforms relied on by hundreds of millions globally. He founded Horus Labs in 2022 to address one of the continent's most urgent challenges, the absence of sovereign high-performance compute. Horus Labs is enabling governments, enterprises, and innovators to run compliant cloud GPU and AI workloads locally advancing digital sovereignty, economic inclusion, and Africa's long-term technological resilience. My question to you, Raymond, is this. You've been vocal about the need for Africa to build sovereign local compute capacity. Why has this issue become so important globally? And what is driving the push for AI infrastructure sovereignty across regions? Um, I think if we, if we take a look at what's happening with AI and current geopolitics, right, it's um, quite clear that uh, compute has now become a national priority, right? Um, when a country or, or a region fails to build its own sovereign compute, it is a permanent consumer of um, the, the models, the laws, and the actual priorities of another locale, right? It also goes back to what Mr. Madwani was saying about the, the, the way, the rationale behind how people build. In the global south, I think it's imperative that we take a, a different look at this new paradigm that's about to change humanity. We need to look at it from a values-based perspective. We need to build things that are relevant to the development and, and progress of humanity versus you know, a more capital-based outlook or sort of a world-controlled um, perspective. I think it is now entirely up to us to look at this new technology and build from the ground up for the people that matter in order to include as much of the world as we can in that, that development. So it's crucial, it's imperative, not just from a national security perspective or um, you know, from a, 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 a commercial angle, but we actually can make significant change that we, we will benefit from 
I mean, India and Africa are quite similar in the diversity, the population size, um, the, the market size. The difference in Africa being it's just 54 countries versus you know, a single country. So I think we stand to make a difference if we build from a values perspective upwards. Wonderful. Shiko, I'll come to you. Before that, I would love to introduce Shiko. Shiko Gitao is the CEO of Kahala. Is that? Kala. Kala, a leading digital innovation company transforming Africa. With over a decade of expertise in digital technologies, she drives digital transformation for organizations in Africa and emerging markets, focusing on diverse sectors like agriculture, education, health, payments, and retail. She established Safaricom Alpha, Africa's first corporate innovation hub, serving as head of products, innovation, and as a chief innovation officer leading Safaricom's digital transformation. At the Africa Development Bank, she guided governments in adopting ICT for delivery, developing the digital government blueprint. Her experience at Google and Microsoft in emerging market further bridges business, government, and technology. She has a PhD and MSc in computer science from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Shiko, given your diverse experience and the fact that you have guided digital governments, you have guided governments on digital and data governance, how should African governments think about long-term compute infrastructure, centralized versus decentralized, sovereign versus cloud dependent, when they're designing their national AI strategy? Thank you very much, and I'm happy we are the last um panel because I'm happy and sad because the room should have been fuller, but happy because the, the, the previous panels and conversations actually preempted what I was going to say. So I was thinking, oh, they're saying all my points, which is good. So when you think about uh, AI strategies in Africa, we only have 16 countries with any form of policy, regulation, or strategy in Africa. So this is a good question for anyone who's watching this from Africa. And my advice to many of them, of the countries that ask us this question is, it's not an either or, it's and, yeah? So it is not centralized versus decentralized, yeah? Or sovereign versus cloud. It is seeing it layer by layer, yeah? If you're to take the example of the ambassador who was here before and, he's, and she say that um, a chat GPT or, GP, uh, or, or AI is a general purpose technology like electricity and stuff, think of then uh, compute as the rail, yeah? Think of it as the ports, the roads, the power lines. Think about it as an enabling environment for, for the, the general purpose technology to happen. But don't think of it as just a standalone. When I think about compute, and I think we had this discussion yesterday, is compute is a stack. It's not just GPUs. And that is a misconception that most people have, is you're coming to sell me, or oh, I'm going to give you a class of 3,000 GPUs to do what with? Yeah? So when you ask yourself why, the question of why compute, then you start unraveling the stack. And the stack is made, yes, with the GPUs, but we have power, we have talent, we have data sets. It's a model that we came up with at Kala that is called the four, four horsemen model that is made of compute as an infrastructure play, which is power and energy and the GPUs, but also includes talent, it also includes data sets and data systems where it, the cu culture and context is up, actually captured. And most importantly, it captures the market, the use cases. Because what's the point of having GPUs, 3,000 of them or whatever, and, no, and building all these models and nobody is using them? So we have to be able to take care of all of that. So that is how we look at at computers, you have to solve for the whole stack. Not all of it at the same time, but you have to look at it, especially because compute is very expensive to invest in as a country. But then when, uh, when we ask the question, so what? How do we think, think of these different types of like compute? You th think of it from like sovereign at the core. And, 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 he, and Raymond has talked about it, is many countries in Africa are extremely afraid of being switched off. I mean, we, we, we are not going to talk about geopolitics, and I'm not, an exa I'm not a very good um, uh, expert at geopolitics. I'll, I'll li leave to Rudra and his team to talk about it. But geopolitics is a big fear amongst many policymakers in Africa. They keep thinking, what if the cloud is switched off? 
And it has happened, guys. In June, when uh, China was doing its national examination, all of the African uh, developers who were building on DeepSeek and Queen and all of these things, they went offline. Yeah? And now, many of the startups that are going into Africa, uh, who are in Africa, who are building on top of um, Meta's uh, fabric, which is like WhatsApp and Llama, are living an existential risk or being switched off. Why? Because Meta has said, if you don't meet a certain compliance uh, mechanism, you're being switched off. So this is not just a theoretical risk, it's a real risk. So sovereignty at core is very important, yeah? And sovereignty means I'm, I'm going to keep the data that is important to my country. Our intelligence data, defense data, some health data, I mean, being a, a Kenyan, I'm putting a question mark at the end because of recent announcements. Um, but data that is, is important for the safety and security of our people in our country needs to be put on core. Then, number two, we need to think about edge. We're in Africa. Power is not the most uh, accessible thing. So being able to allow this, some of this uh, compute to be on edge, very frugal that can be run on, on device is very, very important. And then the big elephant in the room, cloud. Oh my God, the amount of arguments I've had about cloud. Oh, they are going to steal our data. But there is, like during, I'll give you a very solid example. During COVID, we needed to crunch a lot of data sets at a very short time to be able to enable our governments to make decisions. We couldn't do that on edge or my computer. We had to go and AWS did give us cloud compute to run these models. At times of that where there is need for like a burst of, um, of power and compute, that's when you rely on that. But then in there you work with, am I going to put some, com, com, some of the data on-prem and, and do the processing on cloud? You have to enable the governments to see all of that. But it goes back to the previous, um, uh, the previous speaker who said, when, when, when you, and he said he was so on the map because that's exactly the same, same feedback, is when you go to African government, don't sell them GPUs sell them a solution, the full stack. So when you go and talk to governments about your AI strategy, you're not selling them, oh, this is how to, to get 3,000 GPUs, but rather, this is how to solve for health. And like, for example, COVID, when we went to sell cloud to them, we said, you know, we want to solve for COVID. We have all these data sets that you've given us. We can't be able to provide you the solution without this cloud access and we got the it was the first and i think the only exemption that we got for running the models on cloud so it is when you think about uh, cloud i mean you think about compute from it's a stack it is about sovereignty to a point it's about the use case that you're solving for but also it's about the 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 use case you're solving for but also the solution you're providing to the governments that's how we sell it thank you Thank you, Shiko. You've really unpacked the nuances of what otherwise is a very simplistic, a zero-one kind of a, a situation. Now I'll come to from Africa to India and my good friend Raghu Dharmaraju. Raghu is the CEO of Art Park at the Indian Institute of Science. He has been building and scaling innovations and institutions for impact for over two decades. He is a fellow of the Lancet Commission for reimagining India's health systems. Art Park fosters innovation in AI and robotics through startups, platforms, and skilling. It is also helping impact-focused organizations leverage LLMs for societal good at scale in LMICs and building DPIs and DPGs, or digital public goods, in health, climate, and languages. Partnering with the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor, Government of India, METI, ICMR, Niti Aayog, and some other states and cities. Along with partners like Arman and Belong, it is a double winner of the global grand challenge for equitable AI. Raghu, the Indian government has introduced a distinctive approach to addressing compute access that is now shaping the demand for localized AI infrastructure. In your view, is this model working? If you could describe the model. And do you think it's a viable blueprint for other countries in the global south confronting similar challenges? Well, I'm no expert in other 
on other countries' budgets, but we are very grateful for the approach Indian government has taken. And I'll give you some examples, very specific examples, right? Um, so some of our climate work uh, is actually a winner of the India Air Emission Challenge and also Grand Challenges India. Through this, we've received compute access, right? And which you can imagine is quite critical at the stage of model training. Uh, there's a startup of ours that we built from scratch uh, at IISC, uh, Professor Sasi Ganeshan. Uh, they are building what you call scientific foundation models, right? You might not think of that as societal good, but if you think of sovereignty and core, uh, core technologies that, you know, Global South needs, these scientific foundation models that are used in engineering design are very critical, mm. right? We funded them, um, I'm going to try, let me stay with Crores because by the time I convert it, I might mess it up, right? The number of zeros, millions, lakhs, it's a mess. Sorry, not enough compute here, right? <laughs> so uh, we funded them roughly, let's say, three Crores, right? But the India AI mission, yeah, three hundred thousand dollars. Actually, given the depreciation, it's getting easier. The compute, right? So just cut a couple of zeros, I guess. Uh, but the India uh, AI mission uh, came in. They were one of the eight foundation model challenge winners. They currently are going to have around, let's say, two fifty to three hundred crores of compute costs taken care of for the next year, right? Uh, it doesn't cover all their costs, but they are going to make a lot of progress based on that. So to me, it is working. I will, maybe in follow on we can talk about, I think we have a lot of anxiety about compute and part of that comes from not using it smartly. Right? And we can talk about that a little bit later, which is how you might use compute during initial proof of concept. Needn't be the same that you use for scaling. Right? Maybe I'll Stuff ask you like a follow-up question, just to build on that. <laughs> At least the mics are not going rogue. You supported AI deployments in lower middle-income contexts. What strategies have been effective in ensuring that compute-heavy models remain viable in low-resource or intermittent connectivity environments? Yeah, so actually you asked the question that I wanted to uh, kind of get ahead a little bit, right? Um, first, this whole idea of, I mean, let's take generative. Generative AI as such is, can be very compute heavy, right? But sometimes you actually should not be generating de novo answers to every question, right? If you take a question X, even something that's a bit complex in public health, right? And given a particular language or a combination of languages, maybe there are 10, 20, 30 ways of asking a certain question, right? Now, instead of trying to interpret every time, if you take, let's say, uh, let's say you cache these various modes in which you are getting that FAQs question. FAQs in the old world. Right? FAQs in the old world. Cache that and do maybe a new world semantic search sort of thing suddenly you bring that compute, amount of compute you have to use dramatically lower, right? That is one example. Uh, there's also lots of smart ways of doing compute at the edge, right? We have uh, worked with professors at IISC on oral cancer uh, for actually at my previous organization, Vadwani AI, something more heavy, anthropometric uh, measurements. We've actually compressed the models down to the phone. 